As you heard there, the Liberals are making good on their now year-old deal with the NDP and including an extended GST rebate in their budget tomorrow, though it will be called a grocery rebate, rebate rather, targeted cost of living help, plus big investments in greening the economy and health care, and exercising fiscal restraint. Can the finance minister do all of that and at once? With me tonight to discuss that, former Liberal Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister John Manley, now a senior advisor with Bennett Jones, former Conservative National Revenue Minister Perrin Beatty, he's now the President and CEO of the Canadian Chamber of Commerce, and economist Armin Yalnesian is here as well. She's an Atkinson Fellow on the Future of Workers. Hi, everybody. Great pleasure to have you with us uh, tonight as we Hi, look Rich. ahead to the budget. Uh, John, I wanted to start off with you and this sort of targeted relief that, that we're hearing. We had heard signaled and now we see it will come in the form basically of exactly what was passed through the fall economic statement, an extension of the GST rebate. Does that make sense to you? I like it. I like it because it's very targeted and because it helps the people at the low end of the income scale. It's not one of these blanket uh, programs that, uh, you know, quite frankly, uh, benefits people that are at every uh, level of income. What we're trying to do here is to get inflation down. Um, fiscal restraint is an important element of that. But if there's going to be help for anybody, it needs to be people that are qualified for the GST credit. So I think it's a, I think it's a good initiative. Armin, uh, the other pillars that, that the government has signaled that the budget will focus on are investments in kind of responding to the IRA in the states or, or greening the economy, as well as investments in healthcare. The healthcare stuff, I think we, get, we know what's coming, right? We can kind of take that off the table because of the deals that were struck. On the greening of the economy, um, I, I was speaking with Minister Champagne earlier about whether whatever is introduced is kind of explicitly tied to. Uh, a certain you know type of union job or wages or the kinds of things that we've seen the IRA do in the United States. Is that something you think would work? It's unclear that what they're going to be doing is actually what the IRA does, which ties uh, jobs to in the sector that they're trying to improve employment in to things like making sure there's childcare availability. So we had a childcare bylaw agreement too, but we're finding that we actually don't have enough childcare workers. So it feels to me like this whole green pivot, let's talk about catching up with uh, the uh, IRA and let's talk about clean tech, all of which is needed, don't get me wrong, but it feels like we're skipping over the chapter where most Canadians are at, which is affordability. I couldn't agree more with uh, Mr. Manley about the importance of doubling the GST credit, long overdue, like it was due to expire at the end of March, and it's pretty much all they're doing. But just a quick reminder that the people that are getting it make less than $10,000 a year in income for singles, right? This is like really the absolutely the minimum they could have done. And there's so many other things they could have done. And hot, very high on my list is we've been waiting for EI reform since these people came into government. And it's like we're looking down the barrel of a recession gun and crickets on EI reform. How comes it? It's a good, I mean, there, that's a good question. Actually, if I recall, the NDP has brought it up quite frequently because as we look ahead to kind of the greater prospects for the economy and the concern about a recession, obviously the, the need for EI would kind of correspondingly Increase. So I take the point. Um, uh, Perrin, on the, the scope, uh, Armin was, was right to point out that there is a lot of focus from the government uh, in the lead up to this on the scope of their response to uh, what Joe Biden has set up through subsidization and the, the kind of rejigging of industrial policy in the United States. When you think about the scope of the federal government's response, what are you hoping to see? Well, the government has no choice, Fashi, but to respond. Uh, I wish that we weren't in this situation. I don't like it when we're in contests using the taxpayer's checkbook. But the Americans have acted first, the Europeans have responded to that, and Canada has to mitigate the, the impacts of that. Otherwise, we'll simply see investment sucked out of Canada and driven south. So uh, that element has to be there. But the key aspect that I'm looking for in the budget is, is there a strategy for growth? growth in the private sector, growth that will unlock investment on the part of the private sector. The money's there, but what we have to have in place is the framework policies that encourage the investment. Do you, do you think that, um, I'll kind of circle back to the way I introduced the panel, John, uh, do you think that the policies that could pursue growth at the same time 
adequate measures that will help people, as Armin points out, who are genuinely really struggling, really, really struggling under the effects of the impacts of inflation, plus exercising restraint, which are, you know, are not my words, they're the finance minister's words. Is, is all of that possible at, at one time? It's going to be a very difficult balancing act indeed. I mean, truthfully, the restraint should have been exercised a year ago, and we wouldn't quite have had the run-up in inflation that we're having, I believe. Uh, I think that we've got to, uh, I mean, what I'll be looking at is, is there anything, is there anything that the government has been doing that it's going to stop doing? Is there any signal that perhaps we're going to reassess our priorities so that some of this money that's required for whether it's health care or greening the economy or supporting uh, low-income people is coming out of budgetary spending that was in some other category prior to this year. That's, that's what restraint is all about. And if we don't get there, then I think it's going to be very tough for the Bank of Canada to, uh, to get us out of this inflationary spiral. Armin, what are your thoughts on that kind of, um, you know, back and forth and the, and the fact that the, the, the finance minister and the government is kind of framing it in the lead up as we, we can do all of that? Uh, first of all, I would disagree with Mr. Manley that government spending is what has caused any of this inflation and that it, you would be hard pressed to be able to draw a straight line between what the government's done and where inflation's at at least at the federal level. There have been provinces like Quebec most recently and Saskatchewan not long ago that did provide broad-based tax cuts. And broad-based tax cuts are inflationary because they're putting more spending power in the hands of those that were not suffering. But we haven't done anything to get, re get ourselves ready for a recession. Before we had CERB, four out of 10 jobless people were able to access any kind of income support. We're hearing now about companies hoarding labor and cutting hours which makes you ineligible for any kind of income support. I was just talking to somebody today that is now down to 30% of their hours and everything is rising in cost. To say that helping these people is inflationary is nonsense. We have to be doing something. And if you take a look at the latest abacus poll, the thing that is concerning people the most is a country that is bringing in over a million people every year to meet labor shortages and not even building at the rate we were in the 1970s in terms of affordable rental housing. And we're losing affordable rental housing stock every year. The fact that if, if the federal government doesn't do it, who's supposed to do it when we, we have the lowest borrowing costs at the federal level? So I, I don't understand why we don't think we can do more. Restraint might be really hard <laughs> in that kind of environment. It is like kind of a trinity of what you're going to pick. And I, I'm not against growth, but I really honestly think that our, our leaders are skipping over the chapter that most Canadians are struggling with right now, because those people making these decisions aren't struggling. And I think that's really problematic for trust in government. Uh, Perrin, what are your thoughts on that? Vashi, we can't borrow our way to prosperity. What we have to have is, is growth. And every check that the government writes at this point is being written on a bank account that's overdrawn. We, uh, you know, we, the government put appropriately, put the economy into a medically induced coma for, co for COVID. They pumped money in to ensure that the people and the businesses were kept afloat. That was appropriate. But we're waking up now with a major headache, and that's the size of the national debt. And we can't, to, to deal with that, we need growth. We can't simply send the bill to our kids we can't pretend that this debt doesn't exist, and we can't cut our way back to prosperity. So we have to have growth. And that means unlocking investment from the private sector. It's there, but it needs the conditions that will encourage it. Okay, I lost the audio though for a second, but I do have to, I, I'm out of time, so I have to leave our discussion there. I appreciate all of you making the time for it. John Manley, Armin Yelnesian, rather, and Perrin Beattie.